Good evening. It's nice to see you all here back at the Historical Society, a nice full room. I'm Catherine Algor. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome all of you here in person with us, as well as the 350 people joining us online. I'd also like to thank M&T Bank for their premier sponsorship of this program, as well as two other programs this fall. If this is your first time attending uh, a program at the Massachusetts Historical Society, I'd like to extend a special welcome. We are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library with an amazing collection of material. We hold close to 14 million manuscript uh, pages with special strengths in the areas of the American Revolution, the early Republic, and 19th century America. For the past 230 years, we have been making our unparalleled collections available to researchers like our guest tonight, Stacy Schiff, but also to everyone free of charge. We also host a wide variety of programs, and this fall we have some great things planned. Now, we're only able to provide access to our collections and host programs like these thanks to the support of our members and donors, so many of whom are here tonight. We hope you'll return for future events, and we hope you'll support our work by becoming one of this select class. This evening, we will be hearing from Pulitzer Prize winner Stacey Schiff on her new book, The Revolutionary, Samuel Adams. She is also the author of The Witches, Cleopatra, Vera, a great improvisation and more. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities and was a director's fellow at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. And not surprisingly, she has a ton of honors. At the very uh, alliterative, she is a library lion at the New York Public Library. She's a Boston Public Literary Light um, for the BPL, and in 2017 received the Lifetime Achievement Award in History and Biography from the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And you've probably read her. She writes for the New Yorker, the New York, um, the New York Review, of, uh, sorry, the New York Times, Washington Post, and New York Review of Books, among many other publications. And for those of you locals, you probably had a little sneak peek because she got something published in the Globe this past week about her new book. <laughs> We're going to have her joining conversation by MHS's own Dr. Sarah Giorgini. Dr. Giorgini is the series editor for the papers of John Adams, part of the Adams Papers editorial project based here at the Historical Society. Sarah has worked on the selection, annotation, indexing, and team production of nearly 20 scholarly editions drawn from the Adams Papers, covering the history of American political life in the era from the Declaration to Disunion. She is also an author of How Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family, and the forthcoming Our Library in Paris. And Sarah also writes frequently uh, about early American thought and culture for the Smithsonian. So if you'll just welcome our guests, we'll get the conversation started. Well, we're delighted to welcome you back and to welcome your scholarship on the revolutionary Samuel Adams. Now, I spend my days and my nights with 10 generations worth of Adams papers, and I learned a lot from your book. And the first thing was, it's Samuel and never Sam Adams. So how did you first meet Samuel Adams, and what did you think of him? He made a cameo in my Ben Franklin book um, when I don't think I gave too much thought really to who he was and what he was doing there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd gone back to that. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I'd gone back to that and started thinking, why is he so little known? And at the same time, began to look at what the 18th century sources have to say about him. And as you know, every 18th century, every, all of his contemporaries talk about him as, I mean, Jefferson calls him the most active, the earliest, and the most persevering man of the revolution. John Adams says the true history of the revolution cannot be written without the character of Samuel Adams. And yet it was. So what did they know that we didn't? Mm -hmm. And this was particularly mortifying to me because I am from Adams, Massachusetts. So the fact that, <laughs> which my brother still insists his name for John, but he's wrong. So, so, the fact, so the fact that there was this kind of person in plain view whom everyone else was pointing a finger at, and the more I, I, I looked, the more I researched, the, the, fir, the more convinced I was that he was utterly ubiquitous over those 12 years. Mm -hmm. So you have a great subject. You have a gap in the literature. Let's talk about sources, because when you go to the manuscripts, Samuel Adams does something that you say stopped a biographer's heart. 
What does he do? So there, there's a part, I think, of every book where um, there's a part of every book. Okay. Do we need to adjust anything, or can you hear we'll me now? Just adjust for a moment. Thanks for bearing with us. It's on. Okay. Is that better if I'm... No. We can switch mics. Can we switch mics? But then what if we don't hear you? I can project. Ah. Is that okay? Is that better? Oh, amazing. Wow, wonderful. Wow, technology. Um, Solved. There's, I think, a part of every book which, with which the historian or the biographer tangles with a sort of upset stomach. And for me, that was the description that John Adams leaves us of sitting in his rooms at the Continental Congress watching Samuel Adams feed his papers to the fire, <laughs> um, which really does stop the biographer's heart because I wanted those papers. Um, and, and basically Adams explains to his cousin, I, you know, I don't want any of my friends to suffer for my neglect. Obviously, you know, when you're plotting sedition, you don't really want to leave a paper trail. And so John leaves us that account and also mentions that at another occasion, he watched Samuel cutting his document, cutting documents into shreds and just littering them out the window. So yeah, that those were the papers I really wanted. Um, there were a lot of, there was one holy grail in particular with this project. And I think I probably annoyed you. I think I annoyed every archivist on the East Coast about this. Um, Samuel Adams's grandson mentions that Adams's daughter left a personal memoir of her father. It's a 40 or 50 page document. It's in a footnote in, in his book. And I assumed it was with Samuel Adams's papers, which are in the New York Public Library, and it's not there. So if anyone has it, this would be a really good time to mention it. Um, but it never turned up. And I always assumed I would work from that for, for a sense of him, you know, as a, as a domestic creature, for a sense of his home life. I did have his letters. His correspondence with his wife is in the New York Public Library, so that was hugely helpful because she's she's a plucky Abigail Adams type character, um, and, and has pretty much gone missing until now. But that but that real intimate look from the daughter um, also gone, as far as I can tell. So one really interesting moment in his development is his education early on, right? And it turns out if you want to become an 18th century revolutionary, go to Harvard, right? <laughs> so what is it about his experience in college that primes him to try and overturn an empire? I'm not sure I would entirely blame the Harvard College Library. Um, but he, there is definitely a healthy dose of both John Calvin and John Locke in those years. Um, he's obviously reading Enlightenment thinkers. He seems to have swallowed John Locke whole, and he just spends the rest of his life kind of um, coughing it back up again. Um, there are very few members of his class, member, very few other members of his Harvard class become revolutionaries. So I'm not really sure that the timing entirely aligns. Um, I hate to mention a term which John Tyler, who's here tonight, is going to hate me mentioning, but the land bank and how it ruins his family, it probably is more instrumental in making of him a revolutionary. By the time he comes to write his master's thesis, his family has been bankrupted by a piece of British legislation that kind of comes as a bolt out of the blue that feels very much like parliamentary overreach and which leaves the colonists, which leaves the directors of this banking venture feeling as if London has overstepped. and. I would draw a dotted line, if not a direct line, from that overreach to his sensitivity to rights and to American liberties and to the idea that they were being easily invaded and that London was sort of overshooting the mark later. Um, he, he makes very little mention of the land bank until later in his life. Um, other people, including John Adams, do mention that it plays, I mean, that it, it is as it roils the, the, the it roils the town of Boston as much as as would the Stamp Act. Mm -hmm. That land bank episode is so interesting because I think it's one that not everyone is super familiar. That's because John Tyler's been telling people not to pay attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a really hard thing to explain. But what's fascinating about it is is it is the first moment when the colonists you know really try to take this situation into their own hands, and where for the first time after this mandate comes down. Um, from London, for the first time, there is a discussion of should we defy parliamentary authority? And that's, you know, that's the early 1740s. So we have a while to go still before that question really comes back to the table. So this is the moment where he is defining his own ideas of liberty and freedom and 
how an empire can work, right? And how do those, those ideas are gonna change quite a bit, but when do we see them start to shift? Not quite yet, right? And that when he's just finishing up at Harvard and launching his family. You know, as, as many of you know, the first the first act of Samuel Adams' life is an, is an act of abject failure. He really does very little for the first 40 years of his life, which I find hugely endearing for some reason. Um, and, and so over those years after his, his master's thesis, he, he works at a few jobs. He squanders what remains of his father's fortune. He's kind of shifting around, not really able to find his place, but thinking clearly about politics all the time and is very familiar with sort of the man in the street, is very familiar with the people who are, who are helping members of the House of, of, of Representatives to, um, to legislate, is kind of ghostwriting a little bit for people. He's helping, he's helping Otis with his prose. He's writing pseudonymously for newspapers. And, he's, and he seems to be kind of stumbling his way along. Um, it is the sugar, the stamp acts, which will, as both John Adams and Thomas Hutchinson say, usher him finally from the wings. Yeah, what is he like as kind of a reader, a writer, and an editor? He's a really fine writer. Um, there's a, I mean, there's an amazing ability to take just this sort of ambient, you know, crumbly texture of ideas and and somehow slap them onto the page in an extremely con in, a, in a very concise and digestible form. Um, everyone is a couple of people are using him, including Otis, to sort of polish and burnish, as they call it, um, their prose. He, what was, what was the other side of your question? Well, as a writer. writer yeah, I mean, he's clearly um, immensely um, prolific. And I think that we see this much later. At a certain point, he's writing under um, easily 30 and probably more pseudonyms. But there are descriptions of him just writing through the night, um, essentially handing out, d delivering essay after essay on American liberties and um, parliamentary overreach. So something that Samuel Adams does quite clearly is he has some pretty low level gigs, right? Tax collector, clerk, and he really seems to carve out his own role as a public servant. Like you could be a Thomas Hutchinson or suddenly there is this new kind of role model. You could be a Samuel Adams. How does he use those jobs to affect power at a local level? I'm not sure he does so as effectively as he might have. He, he takes the job. Um, the job as tax collector was an interesting thing to have accepted because essentially you were on the line for the taxes you were meant to collect. You got a premium on the taxes you collected, and then you were on the line for the ones you left uncollected. And somehow Samuel Adams, Adams managed over a few short years to go more deeply into debt, I mean, eight times more into debt than any other tax collector in Boston, um, which could account for his popularity, right? I mean, it's better to have an ineffective tax collector. But it, but he's clearly out in the streets. He's a, he's a market clerk as well over some of these years. And he's a very familiar figure around town. I mean, John Adams leaves a description of him from around this time that I find really fascinating because it so fails to jive with the Samuel Adams, that the firebrand, the you know sort of bruiser whom we whom we think we know. And he, and he talks about him as a man of you know just exquisite humanity, genteel erudition, a very decorous character, immensely affable. Um, but there's clearly a charisma and a popularity in the streets which is, I think, one from either the inability to collect taxes or the fact that he's just spending so much time in the streets um, talking about politics. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship that he then has with some of the more prominent men in the colony? I'm thinking of Thomas Hutchinson, Francis Bernard, and Andrew Oliver, of course. John Adams tells us that from the moment that the two of them meet, um, that John Adams and Samuel Adams agree that there is no one who is a, more, a greater danger to the colony than Thomas Hutchinson. So for some reason, um, and they're not the only ones who feel this way, there's a deep-seated antipathy to not just Hutchinson, but to that very um, closely intermarried, very wealthy elite circle of merchants. And it, it's a very hierarchical town at the time. It does seem as if, I mean, Thomas, titles tend to gravitate toward the Hutchinson family, and then Thomas Hutchinson does a very good job distributing them among relatives. So there is this sort of oligarchic hold on power. Um, 
and this is obviously a sticking point for somebody like Adams who considers himself a man of the people who believes a lot more in social mobility and who for whatever reason, and I don't really know the reason, um, has taken umbrage at the way that Thomas Hutchinson is sort of accumulating power for himself. So you have this kind of rising discontent with um, the way Boston is being administered at home, which Adams in a underhanded, I would say, way, but a very brilliant way, makes the face of tyranny abroad. I mean, there's a real correlation. He, he begins to make, he begins to imply and, and later more than imply that there's some kind of collusion or some kind of corruption going on um, with this very tight circle of families. And if, and this is a, and that this is a, a homegrown uh, face of tyranny. And he becomes, he, because to compare that to sort of the despotic power abroad, implying that there is some underhanded means, some conspiracy, conspiracy at work here from the other side. And, and I should say both sides accuse the other of conspiracy. Conspiracy was an equal, conspiracy was an equal opportunity employer. Yeah. And yet he still tries to keep up ties. I love this letter that we have here, the April 7th, 1763 letter that you've seen upstairs in the Dallas Library. And you can also um, view, we'll tweet it out to folks at home later, um, that kind of gives us some insight into his relationship with Oliver, who had backed him, who had underwritten his tax collecting, right? As a tax collector, you, you, you had to, someone had to basically vouch for you or guarantee your debts. And two, two members of the Oliver family underwrite Samuel Adams's and, and this amazing letter, speaking about holes in the documentation, this is a letter where Adams essentially writes to Oliver and says, you know, it, it's gotten, it's gotten to be very difficult to maintain friendships given what's going on. It's, it's, there's a lot of insinuation in this letter. And then there's like, I would say an inch, what would you say, an inch and a half? Mm -hmm of the letter that's missing right at the crucial place in the sentence, <laughs> which to me is, is Samuel Adams's life in a nutshell, because it's just that one, those just those six words we really want, and those are the words that are missing. But it's this, but it's this kind of mysterious, he's often very good at kind of insinuating that there, there's something a, a little more complicated and a, and, a, and a little bit, a little bit mysterious, and I'll tell you about it later kind of thing. And that, that letter to me is, is one of those perfect examples. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely true. And in Adam's paper's volume, we'd say some loss of text where the seal was removed. And I think that speaks to the ferocity with which he accessed and transmitted information, right? He's really the guy, as you say, who is in Boston's underworld at the time. He's moving through all these back rooms. He has these connections. How does he have these connections? Well, I mean, I think the fact that he's so, that he's so available in the streets and that he does seem to know everyone. I mean, there is an amazing ability to unite people and to join often people of different classes, in fact, but to, I mean, you, you see a little bit of strong arming, but you see a lot of charm as well in terms of converting people to the cause. And a lot of that is the writing, but I think a lot of that was the personality as well. And I always assumed that that missing piece was conspiracy myself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Conspiracy. I love an 18th century find in a reading room on any day, but an Adams one is particularly sweet. Um, I want to get to his writing a little bit because there is a way that Samuel Adams is able to craft a very fiery rhetoric that unites, but also he manages to build and command an audience. What is it about his writing that's so effective? I, th I think that, as I said, it's very crystalline stuff. I mean, and I'm, and I'm thinking here, can we talk about Harbottle Door, please? Please. please. Okay, thank you. So was it Bernard Balin who discovered Harbottle Door? I don't know. Harbottle Door was this hardware store owner um, in Boston who begins to sense in 1765 that something like history is happening. And, and it's an extraordinary thing. At the beginning of 1765, he begins a newspaper collection and he collects most of the Boston papers, especially the Boston Gazette. Um, and he then over the next years will annotate them. Um, and so a lot of what we know of these years, we know from the marginalia in Harbottle Door's extraordinary um, collection of papers, which he then indexes and then re-indexes in this kind of crazy, obsessive, compulsive way. But it's a really astonishing kind of history of, the, of these years. And it's to him, in fact, that we owe some of the insight into Adams' pseudonyms, because he will very often identify a writer as, he'll put S. Adams at the top of a column. Mm -hmm. But he also will, and I think this is the piece you have on display, at one point Adams makes this very, 
simple, it's just after the Boston Massacre, a very simple and compelling argument about the fact that public servants are meant to serve the public. They are not meant to be the masters of the public. And it's just a couple of lines about the common man. And Harbottle Door puts in the margin, um, this is my creed, right? This is orthodox, this is my creed. And it's just, you know, it clearly appealed to somebody on a level that made him write in the margin, this is precisely what I'm thinking. And I think it's that kind of resonance that, I mean, first of all, we don't often see you know, the actual nitty gritty of that, of the mind at work like that. It's kind of extraordinary, but it's that, that kind of resonance that he was able somehow to convey. And he's so nimble at planting stories and reflecting them and refracting them. Can you talk about the journal of public occurrences and maybe some of the well, several hours spicier tales? <laughs> Um, so he writes easily, as we've discussed. He speaks less easily than he writes. He seems to be much more comfortable on a piece of paper. I mean, John Adams does describe his, orator his oratory and is pretty imposing, but Samuel Adams seems most at his ease with a pen and paper. And after Boston, in 1768, troops arrive in Boston for the first time. He seems to, at this point, with a group of friends, found a kind of news service, almost like a syndicated news service, where they among them invent or embroider upon um, tussles in the streets, um, attacks on people, um, thefts, profanity on the Sabbath, pretty much any misdeed that they can conjure on the part of the British regulars. Um, there are a tremendous number of women who are harassed, abused, or violated. Um, you know, a man will come home and find a British bread coat in his daughter's bed, according to this Journal of Occurrences. And then the beauty of these pieces is that they are written and then dispatched to New York, where they're reprinted in the paper there, and then dispatched to Philadelphia, where they're reprinted. And only then do they get sent back to Boston, where they're printed, when nobody really remembers if they ever happened in the first place. So it's this kind of you know, brilliant, and, and maybe some of them did. There doesn't seem to be a lot of documentation in the, in the legal papers that any of this ever really happened. But as Thomas Hutchinson, you know, who's puffing and puffing throughout all of this makes very clear all of these fictitious accounts of collisions between soldiers and civilians, this isn't going to end well. This is inflaming the town. And, and after all of these fictitious encounters, surely there will one day be a more severe factual one. And then of course, we know what happens, um, we know what happens at the Boston Massacre. So it does kind of pave the way um, increasingly for this kind of, in, for the for the for the inflammation to grow over those months, and I and I do think a lot of that. Um, Samuel Adams is very good at recycling his own lines, mm -hmm. and so with a lot of those pieces, you can see him borrowing from things which he used elsewhere, and, and and that's how I'm that's how I've traced back what how much of that is indeed Adams's work. And if you'd like to do some detective work like Stacy, the Harbottle Door newspapers, as annotated, are available free to browse on the MHS website. So enjoy. I, mean, I, I, mean, I would say whenever I needed a Boston Gazette article, I always Sorry. used Harbottle Doors because they, there were, there's always a little delicious surprise in the margins about something. And, and often it's quite, I mean, he really reviled Thomas Hutchinson. So very often it's, oh, the vile traitor, exclamation point, exclamation point. So. Another way that you really capture Samuel Adams' profile is through his friend's eyes to a degree. So I'm thinking of John Hancock and I'm thinking of James Otis Jr. And who are these men to Adams? How do they challenge and support each other? Because they're larger than life figures as well. They're, they're larger than life figures, but I think um, we tend to have a sort of warped perception of them. Mm -hmm. um, I somehow, never realized. I, I don't think that anyone really liked John Hancock, or if they did, I guess they didn't put that on paper. Um, John Hancock seems to have been as interested in um, his wardrobe as he was in any kind of real political move. Um, and Adams, um, in the minds of cynics, and I think this was probably fairly close to the truth, Adams pretty much calculated that, Hutch, that Hancock would appreciate being in a position of political power and that the party would very much appreciate Hancock's immense fortune and that that was a pretty good um, a pretty good arrangement for all concerned. Hancock is a bit of a political weather vane um, and he sometimes seems to be very much allied with Adams. Some of Adams' most um, kind of manipulative um, maneuvers will be done in tandem with, with John Hancock, um, including the publication of, of Thomas Hutchinson's private letters. But at other times, Hancock is very easily pried away from, from his side. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, 
when at one point Thomas Hutchinson will convince John Hancock that essentially he's wasting his fortune and Hancock will say, I'm never going to speak to, John, to Samuel Adams again, and I hope never to see him again. And in fact, several years go by before friends are able to reconcile them. So that's a sort of on again, off again relationship between two men who have relatively little in common, except for the fact that they do, you know, they spend so much of these years fighting side by side. And then they are together, of course, at, at Lexington in a swamp. So, yeah. And then we have James Otis, someone who may not be the most familiar name to some, but to, to Samuel Adams is an incredibly, and to John Adams, an incredibly pivotal figure in the events leading up to the revolution. I mean, the, the moment where he's arguing the writs of assistance and, and John Adams says in that moment that the child, you know, the revolution, independence is born. Um, so what's the relationship like between Otis and Samuel Adams? So Otis, insofar as Adams has a mentor, it's, it's Otis. Mm -hmm. um, who really, who, you know, who's utterly brilliant, who has in fact argued this case, I mean, who, who really can, first of all, speak for three hours without stopping and, and always in an, in an incredibly interesting way, is immensely eloquent and immensely learned. Um, and who also clearly is suffering from something. I don't know, does anyone, has anyone ever diagnosed what Otis had? Um, suffering from something that allowed him, he sounds very manic a lot of the time. Um, and it will be very difficult for Samuel Adams, who has really learned what he's learned in part at Otis's side, and has helped Otis to write things, has very much stood up for Otis when he's offended people in town, which he does fairly regularly. Um, Adams will try very hard to sort of continue to um, incorporate Otis into plans, even when Otis is clearly verging into, into some kind of mania or some kind of mental illness. And there's a very poignant letter in which Adams says, you know, I have Basically, I have tears in my eyes having to, you know, having to write this, but be gentle with him, essentially, is his message. Mm -hmm. um, and, at, and Otis, at one point, is sort of carried off to be in custody, to be taken in custody for, for his own health. He's extremely unpredictable. He has kind of days where he's a Tory and days where he's a Whig and days where he shoots guns out the window. I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult. And somehow Adams has to tame him. Um, and which he, which he seems to do a great deal of the time, which also, I think, speaks to this ability to um, to get to make men cooperate where they otherwise might not. So I think we have a fuller image of him and his education and his political influences, his good friends, his political struggles, his economic struggles. We've got to remember the ladies. So can you talk a little bit about his wives and his family life? And how did you get a picture of him as a father and a husband? <laughs> Well, I would have a better picture if I had those pages. <laughs> um, hint, hint. <laughs> um, the, the only picture we, we have some of what the daughter, um, well, some of what the daughter leaves in the archives, and we have a little bit of we have letters from from his two wives. Mm -hmm. So we, have, we know particularly about the second wife, um, and the reason we know more about her is because the two of them are separated. Um, he spends many years in Philadelphia, many years commuting back and forth between Boston and Philadelphia. And so there's correspondence over those years. You always have to hope that your subject and his and his nearest and dearest are separated because otherwise you don't end up with the letters. Um, and, and it's from those letters that we know, A, how immensely close they are. I mean, really, he talks politics with her all the time. She's immensely interested in what he's doing um, in Congress. Obviously, he has to be very guarded about what he says. He, you know, he, there are many jokes about, you know, I, I, I'm writing you only about politics, but I know you really want to hear this. I'm not sure that's really what she wanted to hear. Um, and, the, and the family, and we should have said this, I suppose, has is is so um, he is so ill provided for his family that while he is at Congress, um, Betsy, the second wife, will actually do some kind of perform some kind of manual labor to support the family. Um, so she's clearly a very plucky, very resourceful character, um, and they're immensely close. Abigail leaves that charming letter about how how strong the, the relationship is between the two of them, but how unaffected they seem together. I mean, they seem extremely well paired. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things, and I know you're all going to enjoy this too, is the way that you resurrect Samuel Adams' Boston. So the gritty streets, 
the weather in October was just warm enough to open a window while you were writing a letter. The little painterly touches that you have are just really exquisite, the sensory landscape that you build. How do you do that? How do you research <laughs> something like that? I want well, to know. to the Massachusetts Historical Society. <laughs> and you read a lot, thanks to Elaine Heavey, you read a lot of 18th century <laughs> newspapers um, because it's astonishing what you could buy on the streets of Boston in 1760. Um, mm -hmm. Like a pineapple or a piano, or I mean, you could do you could get French lessons. You could buy French shoes. I mean, it's a, it was a very sophisticated town. Everyone who comes, um, every every Londoner who comes, says he feels tremendously comfortable in Boston. It feels very sophisticated. It feels very elegant. Um, the facades are of a pearly white. There's always this. There's always there's a, there are a great number of comments from visitors from abroad about how clean Boston is, how it's pale and graceful and elegant, like its women. So um, a lot of that. The prices, you know, were very pleasing to a foreigner. The, you know, there were there were oysters whenever you wanted them. Um, it, you know, it's lots of descriptions of what's being served at the table, and it's a very sophisticated fare. So anyway, a lot of that was the newspapers. Um, some of that was the British officers who come, who say that they love Boston. It's very charming. They wish the people would be more like the town. Um, and um, and some of that is from travelers from um, who have traveled through across the up and down the East Coast and have left memoirs. And you answered a question we get a lot in the Adams Papers, which is, what did they sound like? You know, that's a shift. That's a mm -hmm. that's a hard one. I don't know what they sounded like. We know what a New England accent sounded mm -hmm. like, but we don't know how British they sounded. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Have you ever read anything to fit? I mean, there's there's clearly a sort of nasal twang that's described by many travelers. Um, so it was it was always clear who was a New Englander, and you hear a lot about this from the Continental Congress as well. But did they sound like an Englishman? Mm -hmm. And I've always assumed that if officers could, if, if British officers, when they arrive in, in 1775, could disappear into the countryside and nobody could seem to find them because they're deserters and nobody notices their accents, then probably the accents were fairly consistent, but I actually don't know the answer. There's a moment I know when John Adams is at the court in London and he does write briefly that he doesn't sound like anyone else there. And I can't tell if he's real happy about it or real fish out of water. Because it's I'm John, sure John Adams. Adams ever sounded like everybody else there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Franklin, when he's in Paris, talks when John Adams comes, one of the few things he likes about John Adams having arrived is that he'd missed the, new, the sound of New England. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's lovely. I think that's the only nice thing he says about John Adams. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Samuel Adams Boston is real specific, and, and he, had, he seems to have a real understanding of the city like no one else. There's a real understanding, and there is also, I think for very good reason, being a New Englander, um, a sense of superiority. Um, which does not necessarily bode well for the New England delegation when they arrive in Philadelphia. But there is a sense, and I think Thomas Jefferson very much envies this, of um, New England being, you know, the place where newspapers were published and schools were established and, you know, really a, a much more sophisticated, more highly educated, more literate population than anywhere else in the colonies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just there's so much to discuss here. One thing that I really learned a lot about was Samuel Adams' views on slavery. Um, that's one thing which is easily documented in one respect and not so much in another. When he marries for the second time, his former mother-in-law offers the couple a slave, which was a not apparently unusual wedding present for a well-off family at the time. And Adams balks at the offer and says that she can come, the, the woman's name is Surrey, that Surrey can come and live with them, but only if she's free. And she does for, in fact, many decades. And in, in all the letters, actually, that he writes back from Philadelphia to Boston, he, he's always, he always asks after Surrey, asks after the children, asks after Surrey routinely. Um, so that we know. What we don't know is there are a number of petitions in those years to um, end the slave trade. And he's active in those. People write to him and say, can you help me with these? But nothing ever seems to come of them. And I'm, I'd actually, because I was really focusing on Adams, I never followed any of those further along. But he, he seems very committed. People know, that, know which side he's on, but nothing seems to come of any of those efforts. Mm -hmm. Folks who are here and folks who are joining us from afar will turn to your questions in just a couple of minutes. So start dreaming them up. Um, I have to ask, is there kind of a, a cut scene or a deleted episode? <laughs> So we'd love to share about there's, there's an entire book that got deleted, yes. Um, you know, I think the 
I think the scene that I that I had the most fun writing, well, there are a couple of scenes I had the most fun writing. He's very wily and it's just fascinating to watch him because he does, to me, he felt like he was almost a cartoon character running circles around British officials. Mm -hmm. But but the scene I think I had the most fun writing is a scene we have from two sources. Mm -hmm. And that is um, him preparing to go to Philadelphia um, John Adams writes a lot about how nervous he is about the First Continental Congress because for the first time, these New Englanders are going to sit among men whom John perceives to be more sophisticated and, and more worldly than are they. He thinks of himself as just a poor farmer by comparison. Samuel may or may not have been nervous, but what we do know about him was that he was incredibly shabby. Um, he was very poor. You can tell from the Copley portrait how much he cared about his wardrobe. I mean, those lapels seem to be kind of falling off the suit. And before he goes to Philadelphia, um, someone dispatches to his home um, first a first a tailor, and then a wig maker, and then a shoemaker. And it's this kind of fairy tale procession of trades, and they all, each of them call on the call at the Adams house to take his measure. And then sometime later appears at the doorstep um, a trunk with his name on it, with an entirely new wardrobe for him to wear in Philadelphia. And we have this account for, in, in two different versions. But it's in the first version, which are the Andrews letters, it's it's used as proof of how noble he is and how much admired he is and how resolute he is and how immensely fond Bostonians are of him. And I just I, I always knew I couldn't wait to write that scene. So that was just that for me, that was most a pleasure while watching him throw his papers into the fire was a displeasure. And I won't give away any spoilers, but I encounter Samuel Adams so much in the 1780s and 1790s when he's kind of battling party differences, even with John and Abigail and others, he really seems to still have significant clout in Boston and beyond. He seems to really retain that grip on the audience that he's built. I think he becomes um, very slowly, he will turn into something of a relic. Mm -hmm. But for those years, he is still obviously immensely influ influential and still revered for the for, for his determination and his courage in during during the 1760s and the 1770s. He has a, a funny thing happens that ability to connect men, that ability to connect ideas seems to desert him um, as he gets older. And he will end up getting involved with, you know, very shady characters and, and falling out with very close friends. John and he will go, go separate ways. And it, there, there's this kind of, John tries to rein him in and suggest that he, that he publish his, his writings of those years. John says, you know, the world will want to read these documents. These are crucial to the understanding of the revolution. Several times John in his letters will refer to the fact that the real revolution is the revolution in hearts and minds that predates the fighting, and that that revolution was Samuel Adams's revolution. And Samuel makes no effort whatsoever to collect those papers in those years. And I don't know how much of that reluctance is just diffidence. He was an immensely modest man, or how much of it was he actually didn't have the papers or whatever. There's no will there really to preserve his role, which he then leaves, unfortunately, to other people to write. And that, that also was a very poignant moment. He reads the first histories of the revolution which is not an exercise I think I would wish on anyone. <laughs> but, and how does he come off in those? Um, he comes off fairly well, but it, but John Hancock also has his say. So it's not, a it's not an entirely flattering portrait. I mean, there are so many moments in the 1790s going into the 1800s where the Adamses as a group are reevaluating what their legacy is going to be. There's that wonderful moment when John Adams sees him as part of a trio in Boston, and he says, George Washington comes to Boston. This also was John Hancock at his best, mm -hmm. right? George Washington comes to Boston, and um, John Hancock feels that he's more important than George Washington, so he waits for George Washington to call on him, and Washington doesn't really see it that way. So John Hancock sits this one out, but John and Samuel Adams escort Washington around town, and John's response to this is, here, here are three men who can create a a pivot. No, here are three men who can create a revolution whenever they wish. Basically, these sort of two squat New Englanders and and you know the monumental George Washington. It's quite it's quite a stunning moment, and it does tell us how he's seen at that point. I mean, mm. It's just yeah, the optics of it are fascinating because Samuel Adams. I mean, he is more than an influencer, right? In modern parlance, he really has this staying power in even 19th century histories to a degree. You see him pop up when we look for Mr. Adams. Sometimes Samuel comes up before John. When John goes to Europe, people are like, aren't you? No. I mean, there's flat Certainly for those years, the more, and that's what, that's what gets reversed by history. In those years, the, 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 more, the more prominent 
um, Adams is definitely Samuel. So yes, when John goes to France, people say, oh, you're the, you're the celebrated Mr. Adams. And he has to say, no, that's somebody else. And they don't believe him. They think he's just being modest, which if you know John Adams, you know he wasn't being. So. <laughs> Honest, yes, modest. Modest, no, exactly. <laughs> but I will say that um, toward the end of Samuel Adams' life, he seemed to have kind of mended ties with John and Abigail to a degree. At that point, Abigail and John were kind of in forcible retirement to Peacefield after the election of 1800. And I think that some of the earlier animosity had kind of filtered away. I'm always struck by, and you may see it upstairs, a, a letter that John Adams wrote way later on. Um, and Stacy helped us redate this letter properly in the Adams papers. So it's a two-way street here between our researchers and our resources. Um, and do you want to tell them about the letter? Um, this is the, the letter that has the amazing signature where Samuel has written to John and he essentially says, you know, you're devoted, forget, I'm your, old and your old and unburied friend, notwithstanding what you might have heard elsewhere, basically. <laughs> and, and, it, and it speaks, first of all, it's, it's a funny echo of that earlier letter to Andrew Oliver. You know, I, these are the things you might have heard. People are saying a little bit different. <laughs> um, but, it, but it speaks very much to what, has, what happens to him over those years, where clearly a lot of there are a lot of things misattributed to him. There's a lot of animosity flying around, and he's trying to unpoison the relationship as far as he can. We forget how messy the early 1800s are for aging revolutionaries trying to reconnect, and I think that's that's just super interesting. I think we forget how messy and anarchic and rough and tumble the revolution was. Yes, and I think that's you know mostly why the life. Well, in large part, why the life gets forgotten is that, first of all, you don't want the revolutionary around after the revolution because it's, you know, it's not exactly a, a fine state of affairs, but we, we prefer the sanitized version. And these were not the sanitary years at all. Mm -hmm. So way later on in 1817, John Adams was doing what we're doing tonight. He was chatting with another MHS member about the American Revolution, William Tudor, his old law clerk. And John Adams said, you know, there's no way that anyone could write a history of the revolution without knowing the biography of Samuel Adams. Who can attempt it? Stacy, you did it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I would like to turn it over to your readers now and see if perhaps we have some questions from the crowd, either right here or online. Uh, you you demur when um, Thomas Hutchinson says that Sam Adams had it in mind to push for independence and as soon as he entered into the Massachusetts legislature. And so if not then when? And does anybody else have a better claim to be the first advocate of independence than Sam Adams? Um, John, that's such a great question. Thanks for that sand trap. Um, so Hutchinson, when he meets when he meets the king, and is reporting on what has happened in Massachusetts, um, will say that Samuel Adams was the first to advocate for independence. It's a word that obviously he the word that Samuel Adams obviously avoids using during those years would have been, you know, incredibly, it would have been an impossible word, obviously, to put on paper. Who knows when it was spoken aloud? The accepted wisdom has always been that he comes around to the idea of independence when troops first come to Boston in 1768. And I should say that that, that many other people will say that that is a Rubicon. Um, obviously, the, the Otis moment is a moment that John Adams will mention as you know the child independence was born. Many people date things to 1768. There's nothing really in Samuel Adams's papers that indicates that that early, that he really sees, that, that he's intent on something other than redress. So when redress turns into resistance, turns into revolution, is really unclear to me. He will obviously, after Lexington, say he thinks independence should have been declared the following morning. Mm -hmm. And for the next year in Congress, he's jumping out of his skin because things are moving so slowly. Because he's completely intent at that point on independence. Until that point, his real priority seems to be unity. And the committees of correspondence, so much of his work in those years seems to be dedicated to this idea that the colonies need to hang together and they need to understand that the infringement of the, the rights of one is the infringement of them all. But the word independence almost never figures into his conversation, except where he says 
that if the British aren't careful, they will affect independence. He may puts the, he sort of puts the shoe on the other foot, um, which in fact is kind of what happens. It's really so many in so many ways British missteps that really do um, upset the apple cart. But there's no obvious line in the sand. I think everyone else mentions a Rubicon. I think at one point I made a little chart. Everyone else seems to have a Rubicon. Adams never mentions a Rubicon. So Adams clearly plays a critical role in continental conferences. But what is the point and what are the factors that prevent him from assuming a corresponding role on the national scene after that? He's referred to in the in the Continental Congresses as the most influential member. And I think in a funny way we have that as much from his enemies as anyone else because I think there's a wonderful line of, of Joseph Galloway where he says he, he ate little, slept little, but thought much. And he, and he says this in a very insulting way. You know, if it weren't for Samuel Adams, things would have been so much easier. He doesn't ever seem to have, he, he doesn't have any national ambition whatsoever. He has very mixed feelings about federalism, period. But in a funny way, his gift seems to have been for tearing down institutions as opposed to building them up. And there is really, I mean, he throws his hat in the ring several times later for national office or for greater office. He's soundly defeated. Um, but it's almost, it's a hard to say if his ambition or his gifts desert him in the third act of his life. There's no, he plays no role in building up the country. His real feeling, his, his real use is in that revolution that John Adams speaks about so brilliantly when he says, you know, the revolution in thinking that precedes, that precedes independence. Have a question from someone online who would like to know why Samuel Adams, if he caused so much trouble on the side on the other side of the Atlantic, why was there no arrest warrant or why was he never imprisoned for station? That's a great question. Um, he will hear for years and years about how he's about to be arrested. Um, and in fact, both both of the Francis Bernard and Thomas Hutchinson, the two royal governors over these years are trying by every kind of every method possible to see that they can that, that they can have these sort of few troublemakers arrested the feeling for many years is that this is really just a couple of disappointed men of desperados who are causing all this trouble if they could just be carted off to prison or got rid of in some way everything will settle down um, and adams is always the first person on that list ultimately he in fact is um he is prescribed as a traitor, he and John Hancock. Um, and it is for that reason that the book opens with Paul Revere's ride, because it occurred to me one day that we all know that Paul Revere gets on his horse in mid-April 1775 and rides west, but I don't think any of us ever thinks about where he's going. And where he's going is to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock that they are about to be arrested, um, because that, in fact, was the order that General Gage had received from London. Um, to arrest these two finally, because after attempt after attempt to sort of pin something on them, it's time, you know, impatience is exhausted, it's time to get rid of them. And that is really the message that Paul Revere um, is meant, Dr. Warren sends Paul Revere to impart that night. Weirdly, Gage's orders to his men are to confiscate the munitions in Concord. So we don't know what the why that disconnect between what Gage was ordered to do and what he orders his men to do. That we have no real explanation for that. But the idea that evening, as most people interpreted it to be, was indeed to to arrest these two traitors. You may have already answered this, but I, I couldn't hear everything. I'm wondering if. Uh, what the motive was for destroying evidence or information. You know, it sounds so familiar to what happened during the Trump uh, presidency. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I just wonder um, what you think his motive was for uh, destroying his records that he didn't want anybody else to know about. That is a connection I had never made before, and now I might now I not be might not be able to unthink. Thank you for that. Um, it was purely a matter of of, re of rescuing his friends. It was purely a matter of making sure that no one el no one could be charged with sedition. So he felt he was doing this to protect his colleagues. Um, at one point, when he is in Philadelphia, 
and this is a letter that's in the New York Public Library, a friend will write to him. It's actually a friend who only ever appears once in the Samuel Adams papers, and this is the letter, and says, um, I made a little quick stop at your house, and I carted away the barrels of papers that were there so that those vultures would have nothing to prey upon. So there really is this sense of him holding you know, a lot of papers that would have incriminated a lot of people as having been complicit in whatever, the Boston Tea Party, you know, whatever acts of you know, sedition they could have been charged with at a time when nobody obviously knew how this was all going to turn out. You know, we didn't know we were going to win a revolution at that point. So this really was a protection, was, was a protection of a kind. And now I'm going to unthink what you just asked. <laughs> Following up on the last question, is Sam Adams, Samuel Adams, <laughs> <sorry about that. laughs> Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> why, are you, why are you assuming he's a figure of the left? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't. I, I'm really bad at the bringing the historical figure into the modern world. I will say that those those lines, for example, to which Harbottle Door responded with such enthusiasm that the government works for the people, and you know, Adams talks very, I think, very evocatively about how, as a very young man, he was taught not to despise the opinions of the man in the street, and he says this stayed with him all his life. So, in that respect. I mean, is he a populist? I, I'm not really sure where that puts him today. We're talking about a world where there were no political parties. Um, you know, he's certainly an anti-elitist, and that aversion to this tight circle of, you know, of moneyed merchants, which surely must have had something to do with the land bank. You know, this, is, this was an attempt by other lesser merchants, business people, to somehow finance businesses that they couldn't otherwise finance because there was no species, there was no currency in New England to speak of. That was a direct threat to this very small elite, which obviously backfired. So that, that allergy is clearly there from the beginning, but I'm not sure where that would place him on today's political spectrum. Here's another question from online. Did Samuel Adams have an opinion about Chase's rebellion? Yes, he did, and actually that might speak to your question very well. Um, he, at that, it, with Shays' Rebellion, he is absolutely unswervingly certain that the rebellion, sh that, the, that the ringleader should be prosecuted, because his feeling is, having you know, led all kinds of um, unruly affairs throughout his life and, and encouraged civil unrest, to um, rebel against an authority that is unfairly imposed on you and arbitrarily imposed on you from elsewhere is one thing, but to rebel against an established government in which you participate is unacceptable. And so he actually thinks that the ringleaders should hang and John Hancock pardons them. But there's a real distinction there between a government in which you participate and a government which is, in which you are, which as he puts it at one point, in which you are as complicit as you would be if, if you were living in the moon. Hi, uh, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, my question, I just wanted to know, uh, how would you compare Sam Adams' thoughts from then, uh, from then uh, to now in today's uh, normal space, those characteristics being so influential to, uh, to uh, common people? Um, in terms of the common people? Yeah, to common people in terms of, you know, we were saying he was so influential in terms of just being to the common people and also how he wasn't so, I would say, right in everyone's faces, but at the same time, he was kind of having a step back, you know, he was like in the shadow, but at the same time, he was still being influential, being able to be a really positive impact at that time. I think he's an, ama an amazingly um, agile connector of people. And there's really, I mean, in, of everyone, there's no sense there's no sense of discriminating against people based on anything. He was very, he's very interested in girls being educated, which is a completely outlandish concept, you know, at the time. Um, there's, there's a real sense here of what can be accomplished when ordinary people work together. I think that's probably the thing on which he insists, you know, most loudly, that ordinary citizens do not understand the power that they have if they actually effectively unite. Um, and he, he, he makes this point through any number of parables. Um, in one, he talks about a philosopher who falls asleep with a mouse in his hand and the mouse bites his way to freedom. And he compares that to, you know, the ability to actually, you know, when you least expect it, effectively um, achieve, achieve change. I'm fascinated looking at your writing career, trying to figure out a through line. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, other than uh, going from 
someone like Cleopatra, who presumably didn't leave voluminous records uh, that are stored in some wonderful institution like NHS, uh, to the difficulties you had with Sam. I don't know, but what, just on a personal level, what, what is, uh, you know, the lockup and other things? What, uh, what's uh, going on here? It's wonderful. We all have gained so much from it. But I think that um, I might have to plead guilty to a case of professional ADD. Um, there's, there's a certain, I think, reaction of one book to the previous book to some extent. Um, Cleopatra was an idea with which I had toyed for many years. And, and, but first, I went off and wrote a book about Benjamin Franklin and his years in France. And for those years, um, with all due respect to the MHS, there is two and a half times as much material as there is for the entire rest of his life. So there's just this massive amount of material. And, and I felt you know, massively oppressed by that material, but I did make my way through it and I did write the book. And I also realized at the end of it that although we have this immense and really exquisite documentation, we can't answer basic questions. That you can have a lot of material, you can have a lot of data, but you don't necessarily have the knowledge. And that those are two very different things. And I think at that point, I know this sounds a little perverse. I thought, well, maybe you could write a book about Cleopatra based on how little we had, given how many questions I still had about Franklin after this wealth of documentation. Um, and then I apologized for four or five years for the fact that I was even attempting a book on Cleopatra because it seemed insane. So, you know, there it goes both ways. I'm not sure ultimately whether the better situation is the needle in the haystack um, scenario or the haystack in the haystack scenario. This was more of a needle in the haystack scenario. This book fell out to some extent um, from the fact that I had, I was still very much living in 17th century Salem and thinking about the witch trials and thinking about, um, it, was it was 2016, so as we all were, I was thinking a lot about democracy and you know what it stood for and what the fundamentals consisted of. And I was thinking a lot about the first people to raise their hands in 1692 and say, something is amiss here. There can't be this many witches in Massachusetts. Why are we prosecuting these innocent people? And that was an extremely dangerous question to ask that year. If you did it, you did it anonymously. Um, if Usually, if you exp expressed skepticism about the trials, you were then accused of witchcraft. Um, and as we know, no one who walked into that court walked out innocent. So it was a very dangerous business. And, and the thinking of the moral stance, the moral fiber, the moral compass kind of led me to, you know, who is it in American history? Can you think of a person in American history who, who takes that unpopular stand and really reroutes where we're going? Mm -hmm. and, and, so that, and, and also this book in a way connected for me the witchcraft book with the Franklin book. Um, Adams thought Franklin was insufficiently revolutionary. Um, so there was a there was a sense there of combine of somehow going from the last of the Puritans, as Adams has sometimes been called, to enlight to enlightened, you know, to Jefferson and Franklin and the Enlightenment in America. That's the best description I can give you. But if you ask me tomorrow, I might give you something completely different. <laughs> I love that idea, like not just looking for pioneers or founders or disruptors, but pathfinders, people who are trying to to change direction. I think you and I think that you often have a, have questions. You're, you're trying to answer a question as much as anything else. Um, and that, and you're looking for the person who takes you in the direction of those questions or those obsessions. And, and actually, I thought I was writing about someone else. And I kept going into the library. And uh, her papers were to the right, and Samuel Adams's papers were to the left. And I would end up on the floor in front of Adams's papers. And finally, my agent said, Does it, has it occurred to you that you want to write a book about Samuel Adams? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we've got Adam's papers here galore, but we have time for one more question, too. Oh, good. <laughs> when I was learning about Sam Adams, my understanding was that we know more about Sam Adams by what other folks wrote about him than we do about him um, personally, I guess. And do you have any comments on that based on your depth of research? How much longer do we have? Um, it's such a great question. Um, this book is comparable, just to riff off the previous question, this book was comparable to Cleopatra in the sense that we know an enormous amount about Cleopatra, obviously, a Greek woman from Roman men. So almost everyone who wrote about her, for various reasons, disliked her by definition. So you have to read those accounts. They're the only accounts we have, but you have to read them knowing 
who your sources are. And, you know, all of them had different agendas. Some of them were writing for Roman emperors. Some of them had never seen Egypt in their lives. I mean, they all had very different takes. In this case, a lot of what we know of Adams indeed comes from what the crown officials who had to contend with him had to say. And needless to say, he does not come off well um, in most of those accounts. Um, and the descriptions are extremely colorful. But this, the descriptions also jive. I mean, the, the genius, which so, un, so disarms these men and so annoys these men, jives completely with what his colleagues are saying about him and with what he's writing. The picture is very consistent. So you have this sense of this kind of political mastermind, um, which is an admirable quality to to John Adams, for example, but it, but you know it drives Francis Bernard and Thomas Hutchinson and many of the customs officers out of their minds. Um, but obviously, they're very quotable on that subject. So there's a lot of them in the book. It, it is an interesting thing, though, that one's enemies are often more. Um, we should all remember this: are often more forthcoming than one's friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stacy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. MHS friends near and far, please join us in the lobby to pick up a copy of Stacy's book, which she'll be happy to sign, or wherever books are sold if you're at home. Thank you. Thank you.